Right, only 15 minutes late, not too bad. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for World Green Building Week. This is the first of a series of lunchtime seminars that we're doing this week to celebrate World Green Building Week. Um, welcome to the offices of the Pierce Street Collective, as we are informally known. It's made up of Kundal, uh, Mark's the state manager of Kundal here, Architecture Collective, and Simone is my business partner. We're, we form up that, and then you two are hiding in the corner, who you'll be able to hear from later this week. Um, right, today's presentation is on key design considerations for sustainable architecture. Thank you very much for joining us. Help yourself with the food. The seminar will go for about 45 minutes. Um, you're welcome to ask questions at the end. Uh, I will take questions during the middle as well, but I guess I should stick to a time limit since a lot of you are here during your lunch break. And I don't want to make you late going back to work. Um, right, so I guess I'm ready to start. How do we get out of that? Ah, technology is working for us. So um, some of you might know who I am already. You may have seen me speak previously. And usually when I give these kind of presentations, they're about sustainable design things that we do as architects in order to make buildings more energy efficient, environmentally friendly, and all of that kind of stuff, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I thought I would do a slightly different presentation to the normal kind of presentation that I would give today. I guess because of the fact that there are people who come from a diverse range of backgrounds and professions and interests, uh, rather than focusing exclusively on what you would tr traditionally think of as design and what we do as architects, um, try and take a slightly bigger picture um, look at what it is that we're trying to achieve when we talk about green building design. Now, for the record, um, even though I have spiky hair and pink green glasses and I don't tuck my shirt in, I'm not one of those architects. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the joke about the guy in the hot air balloon. He's flying along and he has no idea where he is. And this is this guy down on the ground in a field. So he drops his hot air balloon and he says, excuse me, look, I promised to meet a friend and I'm running really, really late and I don't know where I am. Can you tell me where I am? And the guy on the ground says, yes, you're in a hot air balloon, three meters up in the air, at longitude 101 degrees west, and at latitude 32.1 degrees east, uh, south. And the guy in the hot air balloon goes, you must be an architect. And he says, yes, I am. How did you know? He says, well, everything you told me is technically correct, but it's of no use to me whatsoever. <laughs> of course, there is a comeback for the architect. From that, he turns to the guy in the hot air balloon and says, well, you must be a builder. And he says, yes, I am. How did you know? And it says, well, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, you made a promise that you can't keep, uh, you're in exactly the same position you were in before you met me, and now it's my fault. <laughs> so, try to lighten the mood. Let's get started. Let's start with this. There is no such thing as a sustainable building, which may come as a shock to some people in the room, hopefully not. But before you all exit the building, hopefully um, you'll come to the same conclusion that I've reached recently, and that is that all buildings can be made more sustainable. Um, and sustainable and sustainability is a bit of an interesting word, but I think we use that word inappropriately. I think that, that the definition of that word has been appropriated to mean things that it actually doesn't. And consequently, the way we use language is a reflection of the way I guess we believe in what it is that we do. So um, I've never really been a big fan of the word sustainability or sustainable. Um, green's another word that doesn't sit comfortably in my vocabulary. And uh, I have yet to find a word that better describes what it is that we're trying to do when we talk about sustainability and green building design. Uh, I'm yet to find that word. So maybe at the end of today's session, we'll have some suggestions from people in the audience. So an overview of what are we talking about today? The big question I'm asking really to myself and also to you as an audience is, are we really designing sustainable buildings? And I guess that question is kind of loaded in that I'm asking that question because I don't think we're designing sustainable buildings, last part. Which brings us to, the, I guess, the core topic. One of the things I like to talk about today is this notion of performative design, which I'm told isn't actually a real word. So if you don't like the word performative, we can use the word performance-based design. Uh, related to that is this idea of collaborative design, which I think a lot of you will understand what the word collaborative means and the notion of collaboration. I guess I'd like to try and provide some further insight and clarity, definition to what it is that we mean when we talk about collaborating as fellow professionals. 
how we can use these approaches towards design in order to design better buildings that are more sustainable or more green or more energy efficient. Talk about some of the other key design considerations that factor into this whole process that we go through in order to create the built environment. And then at the end, I'm happy to take any questions and I'll summarize what I've talked about in the presentation. So this was a cartoon which was given to me by a colleague, Dr. Andrew Marsh, who some of you may be familiar with. He's originally a Perth boy. He was my architectural science lecturer at the University of Western Australia. And um, he created a little bit of software as part of his PhD thesis called Ecotext, which some of you might have used or be familiar with. He went on to do big, bright, and wonderful things in the UK, and then his company was bought out by Autodesk in 2008 for a, a very um, handsome sum of money. He's never actually told me how much it is. But um, I think this cartoon kind of summarizes where we're currently at in terms of the state of play when we talk about green building design, in that we are pretty much doing business as usual. And then we stick a bunch of solar panels or some very visible symbol of sustainability or renewable energy or something to do with greenness, and therefore claim that our building is therefore more sustainable. Um, if you'd like a slightly more crass way of putting that into context, this was a wonderful quote which one of my employees found recently. Sustainable development is like teenage sex. Everybody claims they are doing it, but most people aren't. Those that are are doing it very, very badly. <laughs> um, the guy's name being Chris Bray probably uh, <laughs> meant uh, <laughs> further way to that quote. Uh, I thought that was quite an eloquent way of describing it, I'll be a bit crude. So part of the issue is the fact that we do a lot of this, rules of thumb, which I think are the mainstay of, no disrespect to my engineering colleagues, of the engineering profession, and also something that we do a lot as architects, in that we um, kind of have these ideas about how things are meant to be, and whether or not they are the correct idea about what it is that we're supposed to be doing, or what it is that we're trying to achieve. They are nonetheless a preconceived notion that we will take all the way through a design process. And I see this all the time. I guess as a graduate architect, graduated in 2002, kind of working on a project, going, oh, okay, well, I've got these windows, and I know I want to face the north, and I want to get all that good solar passive design and all that kind of stuff, and I remember something about it's got to do with the angle of the sun and the azimuth and what time of the year it is, and um, whether the like, Leo is in the cusp of Sagittarius, and somehow or other, by thinking through this process, I'll get the right amount of glazing on my elevation in order to achieve good solar passive design. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those rules of thumb that we have formed um, are sometimes outright erroneous, or um, have somehow been distorted in terms of how much truth they actually contain. This is a graph um, that no doubt you've seen before, and the whole thing I'm trying to illustrate here is this notion of schematic design or sketch design, which I guess is what we architects start as the initial kind of con conception of an idea on a project. And if we map time along the horizontal axis and impact on the vertical axis, and we draw two lines on that, one line is going to represent a design decision that you've made somewhere in the process of that project, and the cost of implementation, how much it costs to actually do what it is that you're um, planning to design or include in the, in the construction of this building. So basically, design up front um, can have a very, very big impact on a project, as you would no doubt expect. You're making decisions that are going to have repercussions much further on down the track. Of course, as you get further and further down the track, you lock in your ability to um, vary from those initial design decisions that you've made. So unsurprisingly enough, in the early stages of the project, you can have a really big impact on the outcome of the project. As you move further into the project, it's really hard to change stuff further on in order to make it work better. Or, in some cases, it's really hard to change stuff further on when you've made a really bad design decision in the beginning or the conception of the project. So they estimate somewhere around 70% of design decisions will affect the ultimate or end outcome of the building performance. And you've made those decisions up front in the beginning of that project. So no doubt, I'm sure you can appreciate that if you've made a bad decision at the beginning of your project, that's going to have bad repercussions and bad outcomes at the end of a project, despite the fact that end of the project might be several years into the distant future. Next slide. Here's an example of where um, perhaps someone hasn't made a very good design decision on a project. I live in Leadville, uh, Loftus Street. This is directly opposite my house. They've got these large kind of 1,000 square meter uh, lots of land that have been subdivided and people have built these series of townhouses. 
on uh, these large um, portions of land. This is one that was done probably about 10 years ago. It was there before I moved into the neighborhood. And it's a series of townhouses, and you see they've got balconies located above the garage, and it's a bit hard to tell from this photo, but these balconies actually face south. Now, if you remember anything about the whole concept of solar passive design and orientation to suit um, or improve the building performance, you'll remember that in a latitude like Perth, that you don't basically get any sun coming on the south elevation of a building, except in some parts of the summer, early morning, late afternoon, you get a little bit of sun from a southeasterly slash southwesterly direction. Now, given that we know that there's no sun available to a building on a balcony uh, facing south, why have they positioned these balconies on the south side of the building? Well, the reason for that is because they wanted to capture this fantastic view that you get in my neighborhood of the Perth city skyline. Unfortunately, the view that I actually get is something a bit more like this, where a few years after they built that series of townhouses, they erected a three-story development uh, on the site adjacent to that, facing south, and now they get a lovely view of the bathroom windows of the building next door. Interestingly enough, exactly the same thing has been done on that project, because obviously if that faces south, that faces north, and they put all the service spaces on the north side of that building rather than trying to capture the uh, northern sun. They focused it on the views that you apparently get of the Perth city skyline, and there's the very real possibility that someone's going to do exactly the same to that development as what was done to this initial development on that. So an example of a bad design decision that probably seemed like a good idea in the first place, but didn't really consider all of the variables and all of the factors that would ultimately have an impact on the end outcome. So this brings us to this notion of performance-based design or performative design. Uh, I can't really claim to have invented that term. Lots of people throw that word around, but this is kind of my take on what performative design is. So performative design or performance-based design is an analysis-based approach that begins at the early stages of the design process. Because most design decisions are locked in during those early design stages, unvalidated design decisions or assumptions can have adverse impacts at the end of the project, as we've already seen. The analysis process does not design for us. And I guess the thing that we fear most as architects who are creative design professionals, that one day computers might do what it is that we do um, as a profession. I don't think that's ever going to happen. While we're using tools that are often computer-based in order to help us make uh, these decisions on how we're going to uh, procure and finish a project, these tools are about helping us to make informed decisions, not designing the building for us. That will hopefully, if we've done it properly, result in an improved design outcome. So this is my attempt to illustrate a performance-based design feedback loop. And it's a bit of a confusing diagram, but I'll walk you through it and hopefully it'll make a bit of sense. We start with a possibility, basically a design option, something that we want to do in a project, shading device, a certain amount of glazing, orientating the building, locating the building on the site, whatever that design option happens to be. Completely scalable, big scale, small scale, you name it. Right up front, when we're actually considering that option, we simulate the performance of that, which is not something I think we traditionally do as architects. Architects kind of go, ooh, that simulation, computer analysis stuff, not really my area of expertise. That's what the engineers do. We'll get them to do that after we've kind of finalized the design. We'll give them something that we've already locked in for them to tell us whether it's any good or not. I think you can see the kind of repercussions that that kind of approach can have on the design process. So if we simulate it early up front in that design process while we're considering it as a possibility, and we get a bad result, that's the time to stop and go back and reconsider the design process. Sounds kind of obvious when you illustrate it like that, but you'd be amazed at how often bad design decisions get pushed all the way through a project with this kind of should be right made approach that hopefully it will all work out in the wash. Often it doesn't. If you get a good result, that's fantastic. You'll implement that in the design, you document it, you do your construction drawings, got tender, write the specification, whatever the case may be. After you've actually built it, it's very important that you evaluate the performance. Does it actually do what it is that you think it was going to do? Sounds obvious, again, but unsurprisingly enough, sometimes you get a bad result where you've made certain assumptions in that design analysis simulation process that proved to actually be incorrect or didn't take into account all the variables that would have an impact. So when you go back and you get a bad result, that means let's go back to the simulation, work out what it is that we didn't allow for, didn't consider, didn't factor in, and therefore work out what it is that we should have done or should do next time in order to avoid that situation from happening again. On the other hand, if you get a good result, if this part of the process 
produces the outcome that it was supposed to, that's fantastic. That actually means you've learned something, which um, I think is something that we forget as professionals working in our respective fields. And from having learned or acquired some new piece of knowledge about how something works and the expectation of what it's going to do as the actual end result, you can develop a real rule of thumb as opposed to one that you learned 10, 15 years ago from some senior engineer or architect who just said that's the way we've always been doing it and therefore you should do it exactly the same way as well. Developing that real rule of thumb allows us to then go back to when we start the next project or the next part of the process, we can get the design option that has taken into account some of this feedback loop already so that we don't necessarily have to go through all of the motions and reinvent the wheel the next time we want to do something uh, a beginner's video or a bit different in our design. So that is the performance-based design feedback loop. What isn't performance-based design? And I think sometimes it's just as important to ask what is something as opposed to what isn't something. And uh, despite the fact that the World Green Building Week is sponsored by the Green Building Councils around the world, I'd like to emphasize emphatically that performance-based design is not about winning stars or winning points. Um, I don't mean to any disrespect to uh, the Green Building colleagues that we have around the world, but um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this whole notion of gaining the Green Star system, of going through this tick box exercise of how you can win points in order to get your four, five, or six star ways of building. It doesn't necessarily result in good design outcomes, and in very, very, very extreme circumstances, it results, results in, in perverse design outcomes. Um, I think sometimes when you get fixated on the stars and the points, and I guess the spirally stuff, that kind of means that you're not actually doing it for the right reasons, if that makes sense. But um, that's not to say that these systems are inherently bad. I think Green Star is a fantastic system, for the record. Are we recording? Yes. So uh, it's, it's a great system, and it's raised a huge amount of awareness and profile for the idea that we need to make buildings more sustainable, and I think that's imperative. And um, it is, in many Green Building Council jurisdictions around the world, one of the leading ways in which we can set a benchmark for improving uh, the sustainability credentials of our buildings. What I would like to emphasize, though, is that Green Star is not the end game. It's the starting point. So at the moment, I think we are still very much in this mind, we're aiming for Six Star Green Star, as opposed to, well, let's start with the objectives of what the Green Star certification will allow us to do. Where can we take it from there? I think that is when you start introducing some real opportunities for, one, creativity, two, innovation, and then three, hopefully, a much more sustainable outcome at the end of the day. It's also not about getting accurate results. And this is something that really, really ticks me off as an architect who is kind of pretending to be an engineer, but I'm not really. I'm still an architect. I'm not that clever. But I do like Microsoft Excel. All analysis tools are based on assumptions or idealized scenarios. For all the engineers in the room who have done anything to do with natural daylight, daylight factor is the case in point. I used to do a lot of work with Ecotech and Andrew Marsh and training and all that kind of stuff. And I used to get this comment, no matter where it was that I was training, it was like, oh, Ecotech's rubbish at calculating daylight factor. It's not accurate. It should use blah, 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 blah. And then you kind of go, oh, no, actually, hang on a minute. When you think about it, how can you talk about daylight factors being more or less accurate than X, Y, or, or um, AB, whatever the case may be? Daylight factor is based on assumptions. It's based on this idea that the sky dome is uniform. It doesn't take into account the time of day or the or the day of the year does take into account that attitude, but you assume a uniform sky and you make some assumptions about how you think daylight under certain assumed scenarios and situations are going to affect the building. It's not simulating reality. Now, there may be times when you might do a simulation that is a more close reflection of what's actually happening in the real world, but daylight factor is not. It's based on assumptions. If you follow the methodology as been published by, say, the building research establishment or whatever the case may be. So it's not about accuracy. What performance-based design should be about and is about is considering multiple design options and from analyzing a series of, I guess, factors and assumptions and variables, assuming that all things are otherwise equal, what is most likely going to give us the best result? That is what performance-based design is about. Just because a computer can give you a number to five decimal places doesn't mean that those five decimal places actually mean anything. Here's a simple example of performance-based design, and I mean really, really simple. So if you think back to that feedback loop diagram that I had on the board before, some of you might have seen this illustration before. It's from a, a seminal work on sustainable building design called Sun, Wind, and Light, uh, written by two professors. I think one's based at the University of Oregon, which is a, a leading school in sustainable and green building design. I can't remember where the other guy's based. I think he's in the University of Colorado or Boulder. 
Um, you might be familiar with the concept of a wing wall. So if you take a simple room, and let's say you've got a cross ventilation breeze wind blowing in from a southwesterly or possibly even a northwesterly direction, if for whatever reason you cannot have windows located directly in the path of that cross ventilation or the path of that wind flow, by putting these little abutments to the wall, you can actually create high and low pressure zones and encourage the air to move into the building even though the openings are not in the direct path of the wind's travel. And that's called a wing wall. Now this has been developed by doing some testing in labs, and if you look at the page of the book which it's from, they've got a whole bunch of different scenarios that are illustrated. But we can take this kind of real rule of thumb that has been validated, but then do some further simulation to see what it is is actually going to happen in our building. And uh, this is courtesy to Dr. Mark Pittman here, who is the state manager of Kundal, who will be talking on Friday. Yeah. Yep. Um, more about this and the, the software behind which this analysis has been done. We basically built a really, really simple model. We modeled those wind walls, and then we did a computational fluid dynamic analysis of how the wind will flow through that building under those scenarios. So CFD, if you're not familiar with it as an analysis concept, it's quite sophisticated, but the thing you'll see on Friday with Mark's software is that he's made it very accessible and one would almost dare say simple to do this kind of analysis up front in the process rather than being an expensive, complicated, engineer, engineering-driven process. So we modeled that up, and then we simulated the wind flow, and you can see from the computer simulation that the air actually does circulate in that room as per how the diagram suggests. So because of those wing walls and the pressure zones that it creates, the air does go in through that lower opening in the um, south facing wall. It circulates quite cleanly around in the room and then exits through that low pressure opening on the left side of the building. We can then test that scenario compared to a scenario where we didn't have those wing walls, those two very simple structures. And you see here, it's exactly the same model minus the wing walls. The wind is still coming in from the same direction, but it doesn't have the same kind of airflow effect. So you've got wind kind of coming in through the left side opening rather than the bottom side opening. It's very turbulent, so you're not getting a good cross flow through the building. And then it escapes every which way um, except for where it's supposed to. So it's a bit more like a spaghetti ball. Uh, and we can see clearly that those wing walls are actually doing what it is that they're supposed to. We validated their inclusion in the design process and know that it's going to have a more than likely better outcome for what we've done. Very simple and exact example. That brings us on to this notion of collaborative based design. And I'll start with a definition, one that you may have heard before. I'm not quite sure who it's attributed to, but some would say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. A collaborative approach towards procuring and um, completing projects invites us to reimagine the way in which we're going to create the built environment. Um, I think it's a word we throw around a lot, this idea of team-based design and collaboration and all that kind of stuff. Again, it's one of those words like sustainability that's kind of been co-opted and perhaps means things that it doesn't necessarily actually mean. Uh, I guess these I've kind of identified two kind of key considerations that for me to find what the collaborative process should be about, and that is that all parties are considered equal. So engineers, architects, developers, clients, uh, all of the people that, contractors that form a part of that, of that building design process and construction process, they're all equal. No one's an expert. I really don't like the word expert. Um, I prefer to say that I know just enough to be dangerous, in my case. Uh, everyone's input is valuable at every stage of the project. Relating into that is this notion of, um, I guess, how we're trained as building design professionals. We're trained to be these kind of ivory towers, experts in our respective fields. Uh, there's the lovely quote of that the engineer is the person that is supposed to be an expert in one specific thing. The architect is supposed to be the person who knows a little bit about lots of different things, whereas a builder knows a lot about everything. Um, I like to kind of break down that idea about what it is that we are or are not supposed to um, to know. And I guess you've all been in those consultant meetings where you're sitting there and someone's talking about something and you're going, I have no idea what he's talking about, but I'm too scared to actually ask a question and say, sorry, what is this that you're actually talking about? Because that might make me look stupid. Um, I would say that the only stupid questions are the ones that you didn't ask. Because quite often, you're probably not the only person in that room that's wondering what it is that that person's talking about. Now, having taken that description of what I think a collaborative-based approach is about, 
Some might say, well, that's similar to the idea of aliancing and all that kind of stuff where you have equal kind of contractual obligations to each other between the, the engineers, the architects, the, cons the, the contractor, and the client. But I would say that it's important to remove this need of a contractual obligation from the way you procure the project. I guess there's always going to be some element of legal requirement in order for all of us to have our respective responsibilities. But you shouldn't be doing it because you have to because the contractor says so. You should be doing it because you are obligated to each other and because you're obligated ultimately to a good outcome that's going to be good for the environment as well as good for all of the parties involved. So I've tried to illustrate this um, as a way of understanding how the process works. And first of all, let's start with the more traditional or conservative way in which projects are typically uh, acquired and procured. We start with the client who goes, hey, I want to do a building. Um, in an ideal world, he goes, right, I need an architect, and he hires one. The architect goes, right, don't know how to make the building stand up, don't know how big the air conditioner needs to be, let's get an engineer in who's going to tell us all of those things. But here, yeah, make that, if, give me that information based on this wonderful sketch design that I've already locked in all the design decisions on, and now you tell me whether it's any good. Somewhere along the way we go, oh shit, we better make this building green. So we hire an ESD consultant who comes in and tells us about all this wonderful stuff that's going to make the building green. That is the design process. And a bit tongue-in-cheek the way I described it, but I don't think that's really a true design or collaborative process. You've got different people working in their respective fields of expertise, but they're not necessarily communicating even though they're talking to each other. We then get a contractor on board who tenders for it or we do a design and construct, whatever method of procurement is that you want to use, and we hand over all the documents and say, here, build this. And then the contractor goes, all right, I'll build what you told me to do, and somehow we're supposed to end up with a green building at the end of the process. But because of the way this whole design process is loaded, and because of the relationship that we have between the architect, the engineer, the consultants, the ESD, the client, the contractor, I think in reality you get what's called a less bad building as opposed to a green building. So if you started with very noble intentions as part of that design process, you might get better outcomes than what you would do if you went through it kind of without giving any consideration to those things, but it's really just less bad. It's not sustainable. And sure, less bad doesn't sound anywhere nearly as sexy as sustainable or green, but unfortunately that is a reflection of the true reality of what we end up with at the end of the day. Now I have two very, very young children who I love reading stories to at night, and some of you might be familiar with this story either because you are parents yourselves or you were a child growing up and read the story. I remember reading it as a child. Do you know the story about the old lady that swallowed a fly? I don't know why she swallowed a fly, perhaps she'll die. But there wasn't a lady who swallowed a spider that wriggled and jiggled and jiggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly, perhaps she'll die. So on and so forth until she gets to the end where she swallows a horse, she's dead, of course. <laughs> It sounds like a kind of whimsical little story that we tell our kids and we all have a bit of a laugh, but um, in the 1950s, the World Health Organization underwent an operation known as Operation Cat Drop. Does anyone know this story? <laughs> About 1955, they parachuted 14,000 cats into the jungles of Borneo. <laughs> sounds a bit ludicrous, doesn't it? Now there is questionability as to whether or not this is actually true. There is some evidence to suggest that it is true. There are other people who say that it's been blown out of all proportion. Let me give you basically what happened. So the story began in the late 1950s when the World Health Organization were carrying out extensive programs to eradicate mosquitoes in Borneo by spraying village areas with DDT. We all know what DDT is and how bad it is and why we don't use it anymore. Not long after, the palm thatched roofs of the village houses began to collapse. A moth larvae, which feeds on palm fronds, had increased because a predatory fly, which kept their numbers in check, were killed off and annihilated by the DDT, and therefore they were able to thrive, and they started eating the palm fronds, which caused all of the roofs to collapse in these buildings. The contaminated flies were then eaten by lizards, which were then eaten by house cats, which also died. As a result, rats began to invade the villages and create all kinds of serious health problems. And so to solve the problem, the World Health Organization and the Singapore Royal Air Force packed a whole bunch of cats into perforated containers and parachuted them into the villages to deal with the rat plague. So if that story is even in any way based on some kind of fact or actuality, not that dissimilar to the old lady that swallowed the fly. And that wasn't that long ago. That is in recent history. I guess what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there are limitations to this traditional conservative linear approach that we have towards procuring projects. Let's have a look at, in contrast, the whole notion of collaborative-based design. And I've only kind of illustrated four circles, but really this circle 
could be expanded infinitely to all the people that are involved in the process. But we have the client, the architect, the engineer, or the engineers, and the contractor all represented as having a vested interest in the project. It's not just about the client who wants a building. It's not about a contractor who wants to maintain his profit margin when he builds. It's not about engineers trying to just design a really efficient system for the sake of it. It's not about architects kind of pampering their ego and designing these huge edifices to their megalomania. In this model, there is no ESD consultant. And um, it's another term that sits very uncomfortably with me as an architect who calls himself an eco-effective architect. But in reality, I shouldn't have to call myself an eco-effective or green or sustainable architect, should I? It should just be bloody well what I'm doing in the first place. If you want to give that a different analogy, it's like saying, I'm an architect who specializes in designing buildings that don't leak. Well, duh, that's what you have to do. I think sustainability has got to reach that same kind of level. We have to design sustainable buildings because it's our professional, ethical, moral responsibility to do so, not because we think it's cool, it's trendy, we think it's going to be marketable, whatever the case may be. So everyone in this model is an ESD consultant. We all get together and say, well, we're going to put environmentalism, sustainability, good environmental outcomes as a forefront goal of this project. And we all have to be on that same page. I've been in the situation, I'm sure some of you in this room have been in the same situation, where you might have the most noble goals, but your client, the contractor, or someone else in the design process or the project process doesn't necessarily share those goals for one reason or another, rightly or wrongly. Um, the whole notion here is that we're all up front about what it is that we're trying to achieve, and therefore we can collaborate to find the best possible way in which we can achieve those outcomes. And out of that scenario, I think that has actually has got a reality or a chance of, of actually procuring and producing a green building at the end of the day, where it's because of all of the inputs and the synthesis that you get from everyone's involvement that you actually get a truly green, uh, more sustainable outcome. Um, it's very much based around this idea of the design charrette. Do people know the word charrette? Yeah. yeah. Architects might be familiar with it in particular. Um, it dates back, it's, it's based on the French word for cart, and it apparently goes back to the days of the, um, of the uh, Beaux, they're called the Beaux Arts, the, the school of architecture that was based in France. And they used to have these design competitions. And basically, when you hit the deadline, this cart, this wooden horse and cart, would come along and collect all of your work. And then that was taken up to be submitted or for the design competition, whatever the case may be. And people quickly worked out that if you were at the beginning of the queue where the cart was, then obviously you didn't get as much time to work on it as the people further on down the process. So they would jump on the cart and keep working as the cart made its way through all of the um, participants to collect their work. And as more and more people jumped in the cart, they actually started collaborating and therefore sharing their ideas. So uh, on charrette basically means in the cart. Um, architects, I guess, have really, really kind of adopted this and believe it's a very, very powerful and useful way of working. Urban designers are the same. Uh, I think what we need to do now is to take the idea of the shred and open it up to everyone. It's not just about architects, it's not just about what we traditionally associate that as being the design professions. We're all designers and we're all interested in producing a good outcome. And the idea of a shred is that you have intensive periods of creativity where you work together, collaborate, share ideas, throw ideas away, um, kind of everyone's equal. There are no egos involved, and out of that very intense creative process, you actually start getting some true innovation and some really, really creative solutions to problems. I guess as part of that, the shred is kind of just the beginning, and one way in which we can take this more collaborative approach. The importance of having respect for the design process. And again, I use the word design very loosely, not what we traditionally do as architects, but what we all do as building design professionals. Uh, some of you may have recently attended the um, seminars on the Living Building Challenge, uh, given by the founder of the program, Jason McLennan. Uh, he wrote a fantastic book in 2006 called The Philosophy of Sustainable Design. Um, and I've been reading this book very recently since I met Jason uh, for the Living Building Challenge. And it's almost like this guy's thought about everything that I've been thinking about, but he thought about it 10 years ago. So um, I've kind of appropriated various things from his book. And one of the sections is on the respect of the design process. And he identifies six key things. And one of them is this notion of collaboration and interdisciplinary communication. So not this linear idea where I'm the architect, I tell you the engineer what to do, then we tell the contractor what he's supposed to do. But rather, we're all open, we're all here to really communicate, share ideas, ask stupid questions, and therefore actually get better outcomes. The notion of holistic thinking. Now, as architects, we like to think we're pretty holistic and we consider all of these different factors and things that go into the design and decision making process. But I think even those who think they're holistic um, actually need to open up the process even more. 
And I think a key uh, notion behind thinking holistically is acknowledging what it is that you don't know, um, which I guess as soon as you think you are being holistic, then you're probably not in the same way that as soon as you declare yourself an expert, you probably are. A commitment to lifelong learning and continual improvement. So this idea that there's nothing wrong with finding a better way to do something. And I think engineers are better at this than architects are. But um, sometimes we do fall into these old kind of trained learned habits that we just keep doing the same thing because that's what we've always done. It's not to say that trying something new or changing something is always going to give us a better outcome. But you don't know until you try is basically the idea. And I think the difficulty or the, the uh, challenge we face there is that sometimes trying something new or doing something different, we interpret as meaning, well, that means the thing I did before was bad. And I don't want to say that I'm bad. I don't want to admit that I could have done better. So therefore, I'll just kind of brush that under the carpet and not think about that too much. But in reality, the only way we're going to get better is by acknowledging our mistakes and looking for opportunities to improve. To challenge those rules of thumb. So um, when I started talking about rules of thumb and I did that thing on the design feedback group, I hadn't read any of this, but I think it all kind of links in this idea that yes, we have rules of thumb, but they aren't necessarily always correct. They don't always take into account all of the considerations. And therefore, we should challenge them when we feel it's appropriate to do so. And then knowing when it's appropriate to do so is what we are really trained to do as uh, design professionals. Allowing time to make good decisions. Uh, quite often, we are fast-tracked into these processes where suddenly we need a building. It must be done by this time. We must hit this deadline. It must be built. People got to move in. Rents at stake, interest payments, all that kind of stuff. Don't get me wrong. That's very, very important. You know, money is what drives what we do as building design professionals. No money, no building. But uh, if we seem to think that it's really important to get to the end as quickly as possible without taking the time to make sure we get there in the best possible way and produce the best possible outcome, we're almost doomed to fail from the outset. This is not to say that we can pamper design professionals like architects and engineers by giving them more lenient deadlines and more time to work and stuff so they can flap around a bit more and sharpen their pencils, but more so that we um, just allow the time to go through a good decision-making process. It doesn't necessarily mean taking more time. One way of describing it is that we front-end the design process. So rather than this idea of architects working in isolation on their sketch design and then handing it over, rather we do more of the design, the detailed design, the specification, the selection of materials, the investigation of structural systems, all of that kind of stuff in the schematic design process, rather than going, here's the sketch design, now we've got a planning approval, now we've got to do construction drawings, now we better start thinking about what the materials are we're going to use in this project, <coughs> how are we going to build that, and how do we consider that. That is a process that doesn't necessarily take more time, but it means you've got to do more work at the front end so that there's less work to be done later, which therefore takes less time, but it actually takes the same amount of time overall. And then therefore, in the end, to reward innovation, which is something we don't do nearly often enough. Quite often we reward mediocrity. And some would even say that we innovate in spite of the system, not because of the system. So um, it's very easy for me to kind of put this slide up and say, this is what we have to do. I can't say that I've got the answers to how we actually do this. But certainly to start the discussion about how we could be doing things differently that would result in better outcomes. In the philosophy of sustainable design, McLennan goes on to talk about the elements of a green design methodology. Um, and sometimes we take these things for granted. One thing that I'm very passionate about is this notion of understanding climate and place. Now, architects have a particular notion of place and the vernacular and, and critical regionalism and all that kind of fancy theoretical stuff. But sometimes it's just really simple stuff like, well, what do people do here? And why do they do it? And how can we use those processes or those methods and apply that to what it is that we're trying to do. Climate is something I think we often overlook. We take for granted that the climate that we live in must be the same climate that people experience elsewhere. But quite often there are very different factors that are going to affect the outcome. Um, what I often see is this, all these various sustainable design principles that get banned and on the internet. A lot of them are very good ideas, but not all of them are climate appropriate or climate contextual. And therefore we have to work out what is appropriate for the project that we are working on under particular circumstances. Then we can start talking about reducing nodes. So rather than just sticking a whole bunch of solar panels on the roof of a building and saying, now it's sustainable, what about, well, how about we reduce that base load demand in the first place? How can we make the operational or the use energy in that building less in the first place? So therefore, we can put less solar panels on the building and yet still achieve what it is that we're trying to achieve. Free energy, the whole notion of renewables, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, a whole bunch of 
emerging uh, renewable technology uh, sources. Uh, this idea that we don't dig big holes in the ground and take fuel that was made millions and millions of years ago in order to power and uh, energize our buildings. And then we can start talking about efficiency. Quite often efficiency gets put before number one. So we just go, well, let's just make it more efficient. Great. But efficiency in and of itself is not being sustainable. And William McDonald, if anyone's read the book Cradle to Cradle, has a really wonderful explanation of that, where he talks about efficiency just in its own right, and that's about doing things better than what you can otherwise do it. But that inherently in itself doesn't mean anything. So if you take the word efficient and then follow it by the way of building, great, so-called efficient building. But if you take the same word efficient and then follow it with the word Nazi, what's a more efficient Nazi? Is that good? Is that bad? What exactly does that mean? So efficiency actually comes further on down in the process. The other thing you can add to that is that efficiency is free. Ask for more. And I guess what we're truly, really trying to get through here is this notion that if you want to change a result, then we must first change the process that led to that result in the first place. I'm coming to the end of the presentation now. I think before we can really start talking about designing green buildings and being more green, uh, well, producing greener outcomes, we actually have to look at ourselves and say, well, are we actually being what it is that we stand for? And what are we standing for what it is that we're trying to produce? And McLaren has this lovely section in his book where he talks about the four phases of green. We start with the brown green phase. Sorry, the brown green phase, which is basically where I think a lot of people still are. This notion that sustainability isn't really that important, it's got nothing to do with what I do, uh, therefore I don't need to think about it. You don't understand the connection of what you do and what, how it impacts on the environment. Um, I list some examples of companies that might be like that. Uh, in case there's anyone in the room from one of those companies, I won't go into it. Then we move into the light green phase, phase, where we have a mild or beginner's knowledge of sustainable design. We are aware that the industry is changing and that sustainability is going to be part of that change. We've memorized most of the buzzwords and we know the lingo, so at least we can sound like we know what we're talking about. Organizational leaders aren't necessarily supportive of what it is that we do. But they go, oh yeah, well that's fine. As long as it doesn't interfere with what we do on a daily basis, you can indulge yourself in that sustainability stuff. Um, you'll find that the vast majority of the organization doesn't necessarily support that green vision, and that you'll find it's just a few diehards and advocates, zealots even, are the ones that are pushing the green agenda within a larger organization. We move into the green green phase, where we start to become a bit more serious about what we understand sustainability to be. We're working uh, and understanding the impact of what we do and how that affects the environment. Our knowledge is therefore increased. And what you'll find is that people who are at the green green phase can actually produce better outcomes for the projects that they're working on, but they aren't necessarily the best possible outcomes. And more often than not, though, that because we've managed to make a 5% efficiency saving while we've managed to incorporate some low VOC paint into the building, that we're very, very, very quick to market how green and sustainable we are. Which brings us to the fourth and final phase, Actually, there's five stages, but we'll stick with four for now. The notion of the dark green phase, which there are very, very few organizations that can be considered as dark green, where sustainability informs everything they do, from the way they run the organization, to the way their employees think, to the way they produce projects, to the way they inform everything that they have an impact on. Um, you can have, find this on my blog if you want to read it in more detail. I'll move on since we're coming to the close. So um, have a look at that on the website, perhaps after the presentation, and think about where you think you and your organization may be as far as this, the phases of green are concerned. I would say that we're in our organization, Architecture Collective, is somewhere between the light green to the green green phase. So again, acknowledging what it is that we don't know and how much it is that we still need to achieve before we get to where we ultimately want to be. We're at the end, almost. I'd just like to give you a very, very quick rundown of what you can expect during World Green Building Week. Also about us, sorry, shameless plug. So the Pierce Street Collective, um, and having seen my diagram for how we're supposed to collaborate, that's our logo, ha uh -huh. Collaborate based studio. So when we came together, well actually, if I can take the story back a bit further, when I started Architecture Collective five years ago, um, I was very, very passionate about sustainability and I wanted to change the world like everyone does when they're young and, and bright eyed and bushy tailed. And I had a business partner who I thought shared that vision. Um, about three months ago I discovered that he didn't share that vision and he split off and left and went and got, went to his old thing as we discovered that we were constantly kind of bashing heads with each other, finding why it is, well, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you saying what I'm saying and doing what I'm doing? And we were both asking that question of each other. And as it turned out, he had a very different vision of what he wanted 
his architectural practice to be to what it is that I wanted my architectural practice to be. I've subsequently moved in here with uh, the people from Concrete and Intel. And so in Architecture Collective, we do architecture materials. I guess that's what we call our speciality. But we're certainly not experts, and we certainly have a lot to learn. We collaborate with our good friends at Kundal, who are an engineering-based consultancy, who I guess call themselves sustainability engineers, but are now broader than that to be more of a solutions-based. Yeah, sustainability is being an engineering. So the whole notion that engineering has a particular specialization, a particular area of knowledge that they can apply to help solve problems and to come up with solutions. And then we also collaborate with our colleagues at ETL, who specialize in life cycle analysis and costing of the built environment. This whole notion that we actually think about the wider environmental impacts of what we do with buildings. So at the moment, we focus very, very exclusively, almost uh, to the exclusion of all else, on the notion of reducing energy use in buildings, how to make the air conditioner more efficient, how to minimize hot water load, uh, how to reduce the lighting load, all of that kind of stuff. That's operational energy, very important, don't get me wrong, it makes up a big proportion of, of, those, of building energy use. But what about the energy that went into making that building in the first place? What about the carbon and energy implications that are embodied in the, the thing that it is to be built? Uh, that's what ETOOL are uh, investigating with their software and their consulting. What I've kind of discovered out of this fantastic collaborative environment that we've got here, and look, we're still learning. Don't take us as any kind of model of what you should all want to be. Um, we're kind of discovering for ourselves what it's all about is that we're all sustainability practitioners. We're all ESD consultants, but we all do very different things. We all have a very different perception of what it is that sustainability in ESD represents. And yet I think we all bring value to a project. Um, and we've had the opportunity to collaborate with each other on projects. And it's amazing how powerful some of the things that come out of that process can be. So um, we're certainly putting our money where our mouth is. And hopefully that will reap returns in the future. Coming up this week, so you've heard me talk. Thank you very much. I'd like to bring to your attention what else you can tune in for during World Green Building Week as part of our free lunchtime seminars. Tomorrow, we've got Chiara Pasifici from Green Gurus, who will be talking about value in green. She comes from a real estate and property background. On Wednesday, Carla from Kundal will be talking about indoor environment quality, one of the key benefits of green design. On Thursday, the fellows from eTool, Alex, who's standing in the back of the room, if you want to have a quick look see, we'll be talking about eTool, um, the revolution in green design, shock and awe. And then Friday, Mark will be talking about technical modeling for sustainable design. For if you're a bit more of a, an egghead, no, no offense intended, if you want more of a technical detail of what it is to analyze and to come to a green building um, performance outcome, Mark will be talking about what he's doing with his work with Kundal as well as his software development company, ODS. If you haven't RSVP'd already, please see the lovely Siobhan McGurin, who's at the back of the room. Speak to her at the end of the seminar if you'd like to sign up for any of our other free lunchtime seminars. Some of them are already fully booked, but for those that are, we're running a four o'clock session. We're doing one of this presentation again today. So uh, there's still an opportunity for you to join in if you haven't signed up already. If you don't get a chance to speak to Siobhan before you leave today, go to this website address here, ps3collective.eventbrite.com, and you can purchase your free tickets to attend the seminar. And if you certainly can't make it, or if you know colleagues who are in other cities or countries, you can log in by Google Hangouts and YouTube, watch it after the event, or actually stream live um, as part of the presentation. That is the end, I believe. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope it was kind of what you expected. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Alex? Uh, see, uh, on Friday, I believe there's some drinks, networking, sort of casual session after 4 o'clock. Correct, but only if you're going to give us a really, really big commission. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, yeah, if you're interested in meeting other people and coming to these presentations and um, that sort of thing, and, and, and some of the other presentations, if you can't get to them, there's a chance to catch up with some of those guys at, at, on, the, on the Friday. And, Maybe get a chance to say what we do in yeah. the office. So just a few informal drinks and nibbles. Please come along. Um, have a chat to Siobhan and she'll RSVP you. I unfortunately won't be present. I'm heading to Merrigan to do some sustainability stuff there over the weekend. But my business partner, Simone McInnes, 
who's this lovely lady here. She'll be there. Uh, if you want to have a chat to her, she can do the lowdown of what we do in architecture. So. Oh, no questions? I don't be all day. Thank you very much for making around. We hope to see you for the rest of the great building. Thank